All right. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for joining us this morning. This is the first of three sessions over the next three weeks um, that we'll be discussing uh, virtual learning, distance learning, your students and their devices, um, and how they're using technology for their educational journey. My name is Mark Malroy, and I am part of the EdTech team here at KIS. Um, and we'll be offering these sessions um, uh, in the upcoming uh, parts in a three-part series. Um, and today's session is going to specifically be looking at how to find and navigate some of the resources that are available to you as parents uh, to help guide um, your conversations with your children and their devices. And we really want to look at this um, in, from Cass's point of view as building a partnership. We need, um, especially uh, as you know, students are more virtual these days and spending more time on screens, we really need to reach out um, to you as parents to have some conversations with your kids and for you to have an understanding of what is going on uh, with their learning and their devices. And so that partnership between um, this, your students, KIS as a school, and, and you as parents is a very, very important one. Um, and so we really want to reach out and offer some sessions on, on how we can work together uh, to sort of hopefully stem some of the fears that uh, people have over learning with technology, as well as screen time, um, and how to really identify if learning is happening uh, on, on these devices. So I just want to plug the upcoming sessions. There will be two more sessions. Um, starting next Tuesday and then the following Tuesday. So um, they're a little more specific. Today is about getting started. The next session will actually be about um, the sort of the apps and the technology that's used specifically here at KIS. So we will uh, dive into things such as Google Classroom and Seesaw, um, possibly look at creating a project in iMovie and what that looks like and then how a student might share that finalized project um, on Flipgrid. Uh, and so really to understand as parents, what am I looking for uh, when it comes to um, my child and their use of their device for learning? Um, and so that will, uh, will kind of address some of the issues that can happen when we're trying to either submit assignments or uh, create a final product uh, or to have the communication between the teacher and, and the child. We'll look at the specific platforms used um, here at KIS. And then that third session uh, will really be about the device itself. And um, I think at that point, we'll be joined by some members of the IT and EdTech team to really look at device specific uh, things that we can do uh, as adults to number one, monitor what students are doing on their devices. And number two, um, set up some restrictions possibly to make sure that they're being safe on their device. Um, we'll have a discussion then about the full, the idea of full lockdown uh, versus completely open um, device. And we'll look at some of the settings that we can do to monitor screen time, to monitor usage, to uh, restrict certain times of the day of, of usage. Um, and then of course, a discussion about, you know, what, what, why we would do that uh, and how we bring the child into that conversation so that they understand why these restrictions are important for their privacy, uh, as well as their mental well-being and their balance in life. Um, like I said, um, we are here to help. And once I really want to sort of emphasize that, that some of the issues that are arising and some of the worries that, that parents have, um, I myself am a brand new parent. And so my child in, you know, six or seven years is going to be at a point with a device mm -hmm. in their hand. And I'm worried about, uh, you know, what that may look like in the future. So we're here to help. And these worries and issues are not unique to KIS by any means. This is being, especially now, being seen across the world. And um, as we've seen, when the world comes together to try to, to kind of look at a problem, we have a lot of resources at our fingertips. And that's what we're hopefully looking through today to, uh, to really see where, where that research comes from, who's doing the research, and, and what we can use to, to best help us through this, these, uh, these times. Once again, please use kis.support backslash help. Um, if you have any questions about whether you know you're not you're not getting connected, uh, you can't get a hold of someone, your device itself isn't working the way you want it to, um, please reach out and fill out that form. Someone from the ed tech department here at KIS, uh, or someone from the IT department here um, will uh, respond to you and assist you in with that. 
Um, this meeting is session is being recorded and we'll be posting this later for you to see uh, in case you miss anything. I am not actively monitoring the chat. However, if you do have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat and at the end of the session, I can um, address some of those questions that you might have uh, or at least point you in the right direction. So I want to talk a little bit about um, 21st century skills. Now, the four C's have been around for, for a long, long, long time. Uh, and they specifically, uh, we specifically started talking about them sort of in uh, about six or seven years ago, specifically with regards to technology use in education. And the research back then was really looking at these 21st century skills are going to be necessary for, um, for future careers. Uh, just recently, um, in the past year, Stoffer has taken some of this research and combined it with some research about actual classroom use right now, and they're becoming again relevant in terms of the fact that these 21st century skills are being seen to be needed to be successful in the classroom right now, not just for future careers. So if we look at those four C's, um, we all know that we really want to have our students be collaborative, work well together, uh, be able to solve problems creatively, um, and then use their critical thinking skills to uh, communicate well what they're learning. Um, however, we all have these same skills that were, that were being taught to us when we were in school. Um, and I think the most important piece is to understand that the way they look now can look very different. And so I just want to spend a little bit of time uh, kind of exploring what it, it might look like now that the devices are in students' hands. Um, and this is once again to, to, to get at the idea that learning does look different these days, um, but we need to identify when actual learning is happening besides when it's just a task that you're now doing on a device and it's uh, either um, too much screen time or it's being a distraction from actual learning. So if we look at communication, for example, um, I remember learning in school how to compose an email, um, how you open up an email browser, uh, how you create a new message, how you start with dear or, you know, hello to whoever, and then you create a body and then you have a sign off of sincerely or regards. And there was a, th that was the way we communicated. That was, and that was going to be the new thing. Everyone's going to communicate via email. So you need to learn how to construct an email to communicate. Well, that looks very differently these days. I would be very surprised if 10 years from now, email in the current form exists at all. Um, since right now our students are communicating with very quick videos, um, either via Flipgrid or Snapchat or Instagram. Um, and those videos are very short pieces of communication that are going out, but it's still communication. It just looks differently. Uh, we're communicating with emojis and emojis and LOLs. And these things now are a, a communication tool uh, and it does look very different and it might even be a little disconcerting to some about how we're communicating, but in reality, uh, it is still communication. We just need to know if it's actually communicating what we want it to communicate. Uh, and of course, even threaded message systems such as Kakao Chat uh, or um, iMessages or WhatsApp, these systems are very short pieces that are going, that are going back and forth um, in very short, uh, short communicative, communicative bursts. And it just looks very different. Uh, and so we need to identify what types of communications are actually being used for learning um, and to communicate learning rather than just uh, you know, uh, chatting between friends. Uh, collaboration used to be um, you know, plays with nice with others. I remember getting that on a report card one time is it plays nice with others. And in reality, collaboration um, is something far more than that. And the collaboration can look very differently when it's happening across time zones and in different locations. It's still about identifying roles in a group uh, and then working you, uh, to achieve what you need to in your role to make the group successful. Uh, but once again, it could look like creating a world in Minecraft. Um, and that once again, uh, can still show skills of collaboration just in a very different way. Pulling from multiple different um, knowledge bases and putting them together to solve a problem uh, is kind of a uh, kind of summary of, of what we're looking for for critical thinking. If you look at this screen right here, this is you know pulling something from art where a student's learning about radial symmetry um, and taking things from math where they're learning about angles and rotation and then putting sequential logic together with, with block coding. And with this block code has now created a radially symmetrical um, 
a radial symmetrical drawing using code and the critical thinking piece is identifying what would happen if we change the angle uh, you know, from 120 degrees to turning right 130 degrees, what would, what would that do to the symmetry? And so once again, this is still showing critical thinking, uh, but once again, looks very different from what we're used to. And it's our job to just identify when it's actually learning happening. And then finally, creativity. Um, creativity used to be mostly in the physical space. And nowadays with the devices in your students' hands, uh, you can create uh, amazing things with a few clicks. Uh, and so where is the creativity being seen when we can create a, a song in GarageBand uh, and then overlay it on a movie that we've created very quickly in, in clips or in, in iMovie um, and then take a written piece of that and package it together um, and then export it as an EPUB for people to enjoy. Uh, that creativity is, is, is pretty amazing. However, once again, we need to identify if that creativity is uh, being used for learning purposes or if it really is a distraction when it comes to students going, trying to take their creativity uh, you know, too far for the tasks that they're doing right then and there. Um, I always get very excited uh, about technology and learning, but as a parent now, I'm beginning to understand uh, where the, the missteps can be. So once again, I wanna go back to building a partnership. As we talk about some of these um, tools that they have, we need to understand how to best model as adults. And so let's look at some of the resources that we have first. Um, that relationship uh, needs to exist between, as I said before, parents and the school and, and your, your child. Um, and it needs to really, it needs to come from us modeling uh, the best uses of technology, the devices that we have in our hands, modeling how to use those uh, in front of students. So when we talk in our next session a little bit about diving into those apps, um, it would be, you know, it's great if you are able to learn along with your child on, on the devices. Um, and then finally, um, we need to have open conversations uh, uh, with our children. And so when I talk about our navigating resources today, from here on, I'm really gonna be talking about some resources and we're gonna explore some resources that hopefully allow you to have a very good conversation with your child about their device, um, or at least start a conversation uh, so that we begin building the relationship between you and your child with, tech, with their technology and learning. Um, and that extends beyond when they're just here in the classroom. Um, and we'll talk about things such as screen time. And so the very first part um, is having a good conversation. And we need to be sure that uh, we as a school provide you with resources to have those conversations. Um, so I'm gonna be showing you a few slides with some links on them and QR codes. I will put them up at the very end as well. So don't feel that you need to take a screenshot or to, to grab this right now. Um, but I'm gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about conversation starters. So it's important, um, to look at these sort of question starters and, and realize that this is for uh, an adult to ask a child. So um, for example, since your child is learning with a device, uh, but they're still your children, it is absolutely imperative that you're able to go up to them and say, show me what you're learning right now. Can you show me what's happening on, on here and what you're learning? And if they're reticent to do so, um, then there's an issue there. Uh, and so that's the beginning of a conversation because either A, they're distracted and they're not using it for learning purposes at the time or, or B, they're not learning anything, they're just doing a task. And so that's where we need to begin having those, those honest conversations with uh, our children uh, about that, that device usage. Um, and it's okay to take the device from, from your student. It's okay to take it from it and then see what's going on on the device. At no time should your child be unwilling to uh, be unwilling to, to give over their device if they're really using it for learning purposes. But what we want to get to is the point where, hey, can you show me what you're learning? And they're excited to show you. Um, and that first question up there is how will we make sure that we communicate about our device usage? It's something that I would start with right away is if we haven't already, is let's establish a time of the week, a time of the day, uh, a few times a month. Let's establish at some point where we communicate about how your relationship with your technology is going. Uh, and especially when it comes to using it for learning purposes. And then there are questions um, about sort of the parameters of device usage that uh, I want to share with you. Uh, and those are kind of talking more about the balance of the devices. And it really, uh, it's a good idea to establish um, 
locations and times of use of the device at home. And so one of the things that you, you, none of the developers of this technology, uh, such as Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, like gave their kids these devices that they developed right away. <laughs> they um, were very wary about what it could do. And so they were, they were the ones that were having conversations with their kids and they were the ones that kind of built up how you should have the structured use of the technology. And so um, one of the first things that they said is that you should have an area in the house where that's where the technology is used. Um, now with mobile devices, that was way back when. Now with mobile devices, that's a little more difficult. But it's totally okay to, to you know, say at this time of the day, if you're going to be on your device, it's for learning, it's going to be out in the living room, or it's going to, if you're in your bedroom, um, you know, the door is open and I'm going to come in every now and then say hello. At no time should the child have that device in their, in their bedroom with the door closed and you to be able to get there, especially overnight, because we know that the screen time idea for sleep is, it, we need to make sure that they have a break from the screen before they're going to sleep and to get uh, very good sleep. They don't need to have their devices going off all night long with notifications, which we know can continue to happen. Um, and then, of course, an open conversation about what does it mean to have the balance of using your device and other activities. So what other interests do your child have and how can we balance the use of technology with their other interests? The second resource I'm going to explore a little bit with you today uh, is a site from one of our middle school student support teachers, Chelsea Horsberg. And this uh, site is specifically with some tools uh, and some resources about executive functioning, which is sort of the um, ability to have self-regulation and control uh, of your reactions and, and um, how you respond to different scenarios. And a lot of it has to do with tools for uh, technology use, as well as tools for um, app specific app use for executive functioning. And so once again, this is a, a resource that I highly suggest you navigate to and look through some of the toolkit on there. Uh, I will be looking at those um, myself uh, with you in a little bit as soon as we're, uh, we're done with the next resource that I really want to emphasize. This next resource um, is the, the pretty much the go to. And the reason is that Common Sense Media has been around for a long time. They provide research um, behind all of what they're what they put out. Uh, they provide guides for parents, uh, as well as teachers, but mainly what we're going to talk about today are the parent guides for different devices, different age groups, and then some of the common issues between um, between the, the, the those different age groups and what it, how it looks a little different depending on the age group and what their learning outcome is. Uh, they provide reviews. So they started common sense media started as um, a site that gave reviews for media, so for movies um, and TV shows and books. Uh, and then they began expanding into the sort of the digital world of apps um, and apps specifically for learning. Um, and with those reviews, it's great because you as a parent can go in and see uh, this is in this is a movie my child wants to watch. Here's what common sense breaks down in terms of, you know, all of the things in terms of explicit language, uh, the, the, the themes throughout the movie. Um, they look at apps and they'll say this app is good for this type of learning. Um, and then finally, uh, they also give out lessons. So they'll have lessons for educators um, as well as parents can use those lessons at home with their children uh, if they want. So I would like to sort of jump out of, um, jump out of this presentation and uh, move over to some of these resources. So those resources I'll put back up um, in a second, but if you're ever typing in those resources, they are case specific. So if I look at the first one, which was KIS good questions, be sure that the good, uh, the G and the Q are capitalized to get to that resource. Um, but here you'll see, this is just sort of a document that the EdTech team has put together about conversation starters. Um, and once again, it is broken down between communication about the device or maybe the privacy of and security of the students on the device, uh, as well as being a global citizen, um, the citizenship piece, and then even about maintenance. How are we going to make sure we care for this device? Uh, and so these are great places to start with having some conversations um, with your child. I want to look a little bit here. This is the, the executive functioning in the classroom with this, this toolkit. And uh, as I look through this, um, 
it explains a little bit here about some key terms which are very important, uh, as well as um, the research behind it can be cited. Um, but up here, where we talk a little bit about the toolkits, we can talk about time management um, and organization. And these tips in terms of time management can be especially useful for especially middle school and high school students in terms of organizing their digital lives uh, around Google Drive and Google and Schoology. Um, and so these resources are something that I highly suggest taking a look at in terms of their time management and screen time and organizing their school lives around that. But then finally, these apps for executive functioning here Um, will guide you through the um, different apps for different pieces of that executive functioning. So let me zoom in a little bit here. So you can see as you, you go in a little bit, you can see that there are specific apps um, for a sort of organization or impulse control, uh, and these apps can be can be used um, and looked at in terms of uh, looking at the learning. Now, what's really great is you can cross reference these apps with common sense media. So as I go into um, as I go into this next slide or this next website, uh, any of the apps that you see around the outside here uh, can be found in common sense media um, to see if there's an app review about it. But once again, take a look at this site, take a look at the toolkit and any of the references in terms of the research if you want to know more about where they're coming up with these ideas. Uh, and then finally, let's take a look at Common Sense Media. So Common Sense Media here is really the go-to. It's free to register for. There are some paid uh, pieces to it, but this is pretty much, Common Sense Media is pretty much the gold standard, um, especially uh, in, in North America for uh, looking at digital citizenship and then technology used for learning. The main page will bring you to an area where they give you reviews um, of current movies and current books, um, and sorry, TV shows. Up here, you can navigate to For Parents. And if you go to For Parents, it will take, this is the main page right here for parents where it's going to show you uh, the reviews for the movies, TVs, and books. I suggest going and looking at the apps and the games lists uh, because this is where they'll provide your reviews um, for different applications, um, either mobile apps or desktop apps, but also looking at best for learning lists. So if, if you're interested in um, helping your child with specific uh, reading, math um, areas, these lists here are great for saying, for helping with um, teenage math, for example, uh, or STEM YouTube channels. And these are all um, have have the common sense media team have all vetted uh, and will give you an explanation about why they believe that these apps are useful for um, for that learning target. So once again, resources that you can come in, but also if you look here, one of the nicest pieces is that it's always going to be shown for different age groups. So if your child is in these age groups, you can specifically drill down to find the specific app you're looking for uh, or the best list uh, for education. Um, parents need to know. So this is, this is a huge resource when it comes to, let's talk about something that's really on everyone's mind right now, screen time. So for example, I'm able to go down from a parent and I'm able to go into screen time or I'm able to go into all of the topics based on the age of my child. So I'm going to go to screen time right now, and you're going to see articles um, about how much screen time is okay, because screen time, that, that question is very, is very difficult. How much screen time is okay? Well, it definitely depends on the age of your child and the kind and quality of screen time. It's very different to have a passive viewing of video uh, to actually interacting with the screen and, and, and finishing a task to having multiple windows open on that screen and becoming super distracted about what's happening on the screen itself. And so these questions um, are answered by Common Sense and then have other parents with comments um, in, in, a running, in a running blog type form that can help um, sort of alleviate some of the worry, but also show you what other parents are doing uh, when it comes to these, these issues. The other nice thing about parents need to know 
is that parents need to know a lot of these things are things that your students are on right now. So if you wanted to go into all of these ideas of the ultimate guide to Minecraft, um, this will show you exactly what needs to be known about Minecraft when it comes to not only just your students using it for fun, but also learning. Um, and then it will also discuss things like what are the privacy issues? What are the security issues? Um, and so, for example, if you go into the Zoom section, there are security things that they talk about uh, and the privacy issues of meetings and certain things. And so these are all something to be aware of as parents. Um, and like I said before, I am a huge proponent for technology being used in education. However, um, I am a little wary about the direction that we're going with it now that I have a child. And so uh, these are some things that we need to educate ourselves on uh, to best help our students be successful in their learning journey. Um, and the last uh, piece within Common Sense Media is their research. And so they, pr and they present uh, and publish um, Common Sense Research. Um, and here are some, some of the research articles that they've recently um, featured. For example, Executive Functioning and Digital Media Review. This is a, a very interesting article about uh, distraction and the ability to respond to negativity online uh, and how um, our, our self-regulation and control of our responses is being, um, depending on your age group, diminished uh, by too much screen time. Um, and so uh, these research articles are, are very informative and something to be, be aware of, but they always, as you can see, are constantly, constantly publishing research articles specifically for technology and education. Uh, and then the last piece here is distance learning. Um, if we look at distance learning and especially uh, wide open school. Uh, wide open school has free resources for um, for uh, education at home. And so you can see that there are student activities and family and teacher center. So as a family, as, as a parent, you can have this, but you can also run through student activities with your child. Um, and once again, these activities just allow you to start having the conversation with your student because as you're doing the activity with your student, um, there's the ability then to kind of begin building that relationship with their device in a positive, in a positive way. Um, show you an example, some of the, some of the student activities there that, that go on, but often this is open source, uh, completely free. Um, and, uh, had, you have the ability to, to totally do it without an account. Um, you actually, for common sense, you do need to get, for any of the research articles, you do need to create an account. It's free for, but you just have to, to give them an email address. Um, you can, of course, uh, donate to them uh, monthly or per year to have a little more, um, a little more substantial uh, activity set that they provide. But in reality, this common sense media is the go-to for digital technology um, in education. I also highly suggest going into the common sense area for educators. Because if you go in and see um, what, it, what you know, the, the idea for resources for digital citizenship in there is you can begin looking at some of these lesson plans or you can begin looking at some of the resources and just seeing what it means to be uh, a positive user of technology, uh, a positive uh, citizen online. And you can just see what we do here at school because schools around the world use some of this curriculum as they're developing digital citizenship. And so as we talk about being, you know, being not being a, a bystander online, this is where a lot of those resources come from. So if you want to get a little bit more educated about where that is, uh, you can go into the educator area and take a look at some of the reviews that are happening um, and some of the digital citizenship lessons online for you. So as we go into the final piece here, what I'd really like um, to just emphasize is that A, uh, this is not unique to where we are right now in terms of virtual learning. It's happening across the world and everyone is at the same time uh, sort of trying to, trying to figure out the best uh, solution to, to this situation. Uh, we feel here at KIS that, our, our, that we have the, the backbone um, set in place for a very strong learning program all around. And whether that has to go virtual 
um, is, is something that, that we feel very confidently that we're still developing and delivering that education. However, it is something we need help with from parents. Parents have to be able to identify when learning is occurring. They have to identify some of the pitfalls that can happen when students are on devices. And so we would like to have that partnership built and to give you the resources to help identify when that's happening. Um, here are the uh, resources in terms of the different guides that um, I put up there. Once again, um, in a follow-up email, I will share a link to this presentation, uh, as well as um, as well as these resources in, in another format as well. But this is just the beginning. The idea of, of having the resources at your fingertips um, is, is a great start. So I encourage you to explore some of these resources and have some conversations with your child uh, about the balance that they have um, with other activities, how they're using their device for learning, have them try to show you what they're learning, um, as well as looking at some of the, the reviews for some of the apps for learning and taking a look at Common Sense Media for sure. Uh, but then also when we have a session next week, that session kind of will dive more deeply into the specific apps that are being used for learning so that we have an idea of what that learning looks like, um, what that learning looks like for um, all of the students uh, and uh, what you can expect to see on your child's device if you ask them, you know, what are you learning right now? Uh, and that's a great chance for you to learn along with your child. So I thank you for coming today. Um, I will hang out for a little while in this room. If you have any questions, please post them to the chat. I'd like to thank uh, Liz Joe for putting those links up in the chat for me. Uh, once again, I will be sending this recording out as I add at the beginning and the end um, for you to watch or to share with other um, parents that were unable to be here today. Uh, and please, if you have any questions at any time, do not hesitate to use the support site cast.support slash help or email me with my email that's on the screen right now. Um, I really look forward to continuing this conversation and I really look forward to seeing your child's success uh, in their learning journey. So thank you so much.